الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين In the past several weeks we have been tackling the topic related to man in the Quran we covered this issue as much as we could and we mentioned the fact that the material from which man is created has a lot to do with both his nature, his inclinations, his attitudes, and his responses and interaction with his environment. Meaning, we spoke about the material from which man is created, dust, water, mud, and being created from each other and how this affects the makeup of a person. We also created about the fact that in the creation of man, there are immaterial matters that also play a role in the nature and responses and behavior of man. Like we created man from haste. Man is created in haste. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلْ We spoke at length about this. Uh, today, and most probably in the next few weeks, we will be talking about man, but in a different way. When you say al-insan, you are talking about the individual. When you talk about man, you talk about the person, the individual. When you talk about an-nas, you are talking about communities, societies, groups. So this will be the subject that we are going to address in the next few weeks, inshallah. Man in the Quran, is an issue that influences our choices, our direction, and our fate. The environment in which we live, which is mostly a human environment, is where we are tested the most. What do we mean? We are the test for each other. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, He made us as a gift to our environment, as a trust into the hands of the environment and as a challenge and a test for the environment. He also made the environment as a challenge and a test for us, but also as a gift. So you're born into a family. They are happy to have a baby, especially baby boys. Don't forget this, right? Which is not Islamic, but I just wanted to make this point. So your family is happy to get a new baby and you're crying as you come out of the womb of your mother but they are very happy to receive you. So the initial reception is one of a gift. Once you grow up and you start forming your opinion, expressing your feeling and making or wanting to make your own choices, you become a challenge, right? And when you insist to live your way, as a teenager or beyond, you become a real test for your own family, right? And when they start to tell you no, they become a challenge and a test for you as well. So Allah summarizes this process, which is not limited to the family environment. It extends to every environment in which we live. Allah summarizes this saying, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةٍ we have made some of you as a test and a trial for each other. That concept 
has to be drilled in our head and heart so that we deal with it realistically. What does it mean to be a test? Fitna, as we explained before in the Arabic language, is mainly used when you put the raw gold extracted from the earth with all the pollutants into high heated furnaces to let everything melt, then the gold comes out and the ash stays behind. So what do you do? You do a filtering process. What do you get from that raw materials that you got out of the earth? You get the best of what was there. So the fitna is intended to get the best out of you as you get the best out of dust, which is gold. I want this to be clear. Should I explain it again? In getting pure gold from the earth, you extract from the earth a piece of rock. And in the rock, it is mixed with gold. That's the purpose. So you take it, put it in a high degree furnace. I don't know the temperature exactly, maybe 3500 or something. And the ashes would melt, the gold would also melt, but they would separate. They would separate. This separation extracts from the rock, the dust, and everything of pollutants. The gold comes out separate. When you do this, what happens? You're getting the best out of the rock. You see the word fitna? You call fatan to dhahab which means I melted the gold to extract it from all pollutants as pure gold. So when Allah puts you through a test, He wants to see the best out of you. You read this in the description of the believers in the Quran, in the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ واليوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين وآت المال على حبه ذو القول القربة واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل والسائلين وفي الرقاب وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بعهدهم إذا عاهدوا والصابرين في البأساء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والصابرين في البأساء والضراء وحين البأس صبر at the time of calamities holding on to your patience holding on to your principles most of us unfortunately interact with each other not with principles but with impulsive emotional reaction the Quran distinguishes people who believe as ones who do not interact with their environment by impulsive reaction, rather by thoughtful, deliberate process in which they decide what is good, what is better, and what's best, so that the choices are clear. It's not only good and bad, it is good, it's evil, and it's what's better. So Allah ordered us to say what is best. وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ that's, that's the servants of Allah are here instructed. So our environment is our test. And the purpose of the test is to get the best out of you. Most of us, unfortunately, call their negative bad reaction as a human reaction. So when we do something bad and we know we are shaming ourselves, we end up saying, I'm sorry, but I'm a human. As if being a human means only negative things. But being a human also means righteousness. Because our nafs is equipped with wickedness and righteousness. When we only claim that we are humans, when we do something wrong, it means we believe and think that being a human means that you can only do what is wrong. But Allah would not create us like this. He told us that He made us better than what we think. So the purpose 
of talking about people in the Quran as a group, as a community, is to know what types of people does the Quran have. The Quran has classifications. And we have seen when we explained the Quran talking about man as a creature, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not mention something good. Whenever the, in the insan, the man, is mentioned in the Quran, it is something negative. It is something negative. Except for the fact that the soul that is injected or placed, placed into him has come from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has breathed into our creation, into the mud that he formatted, and then man became a man. Before that, it was mud. Other than that, everything else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about us as men, it is negative. Why? Because the Quran does not talk about the human as man, except in it is raw form, crude form. What, is mean, what does it mean? It means man without guidance, man without belief, man if left to his own devices. Man, if he is acting on his own. And most of humanity, unfortunately, today and for centuries, has taken us to live on somebody's own. Somebody has something he thinks is good for us, we boys, and he would drive us by force to get to do it. And this is the system in which we have been living. And that's why humanity is living today by more error than good trials. You know what a good trial is? People live by trial and error. It means they go one way and discover what is wrong and if they find something wrong, they make a U-turn and go back to try something different. Right? Humanity is not going back. Humanity has gone so deep in the wrong direction that they found comfort zones in the new direction. So now, behavior that was an abomination in the past is now very acceptable, right? Corruption that used to be an aberration, now corruption is the norm on the highest form and the highest level of government, of institutions, everywhere, not only here, everywhere corruption has covered the human race. Why? Because we have developed and entrenched sets of people groups and in institutions whose livelihood is in corruption. Now we have institutions that is sole work is in corruption. And I'm not going to name because I, I'm talking to an intelligent group of people. So we need not to go into details. The reason this is all relevant to our subject is because we are charged to change the face of the universe which means human society. We are charged and responsible to help humanity get rid of what is bad and start doing what is right and follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah tells him, follow what has been revealed unto you. Ittabi' ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Ittabi'u ahsana ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum. As societies and as individuals, we are charged to follow. Follow means there is someone to follow. There is a source that I need to learn from and follow. There is guidance we need to follow. So we are created free in terms of decision making, but we are not free to know the truth and avoid it or ignore it and continue to be free. If you free yourself from truth, you are becoming a slave to untruth. So man is never absolutely free. So we'll be talking about the classifications of uh, the humans as a group, as a society, as people. You see, from the beginning of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off describing for us the thoughts and the behavior of the believers. And I want to emphasize these two elements your thoughts and your faith and your behavior are eternally connected 
you cannot separate how you think from what you believe and you cannot separate how you behave from how you think you see when some of the philosophers define man as a thinking creature and Kant in particular says ana ufakkir idhan ana mawjud i think therefore i do exist so he proves his existence by defining the best quality of his existence which is to be thoughtful to think and rethink and second guess yourself instead of taking the initial thought for granted so the quran starts off by saying ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه this book indeed has no doubt هدى للمتقين this is the guidance you ask it for in al-fatiha this is the guidance you receive it is exclusively in this book so if you cross over this book and seek guidance anywhere you're lost because there is no guidance elsewhere all the guidance we need as humans as individuals communities families or societies or nations all the guidance are included in this book so when we want to cross it over what do we do we end up in the wrong place this is where trial and error process comes in so people are living by trial and error because they have seen this book they have read this book they have known this book but they decided to cross over it and try something different and everyone thinks that his thought is better than the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how arrogant how arrogant this is but it it takes all of us in one direction which is the wrong direction so this book is guidance and has guidance for the muttaqin those who want to protect themselves from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the wrong fate and instead of going in the wrong place in the hereafter if you want a map a road map i hate this term but i have to use it if you want a road map towards the pleasure of allah and towards paradise it is embedded in the quran and not anywhere else it's not anywhere else i repeat so the believers are those who believe in al ghaib and they establish prayer and they spend from what we have provided them you see always allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never tells us spend all what you have he always says spend from what we have provided you from which means the quran encourages what saving contingency plans right emergency fund you could call it and those who believe in what has been sent down unto you and has been sent down before you and in the hereafter they are not only believers but they are so certain yuqinun do you know what yaqeen is yaqeen means that you believe in something as if you have seen it so you believe in paradise as you have seen it you believe in hellfire as if you have seen it which means the words and the description you got in the quran about the hereafter ring true in your heart and in your head and if they do they create a different thinking and if they do create a different thinking they result in different behavior from the one we have been using we have relied a lot on culture as a substitute for our faith on family tribal or national traditions as substitute to our faith it is time to determine whether we want to follow our faith or follow our whims and culture and customs and traditions we have to follow only one source of guidance that is the quran and only one person that is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fattabi'uni follow me why do we follow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is because we are certain where he is going so if you believe you want to go to paradise there is a source of guidance that help you and there is a man to follow if you follow his footsteps you end up where he goes right so you have to be clear in your head that the reason we follow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is 
We want to go where he is going. That has to ring true in our head and heart. وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ Who are those? أُولَئِكَ عَلَى هُدًا مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ Those people are following guidance from their Lord. You know, there is a lot of guidance. The shaitan has guidance. فَإِنَّهُ يُضِلُّهُ وَيَهْدِيهِ إِلَى عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ So shaitan would mislead you, but the same ayah says, and would guide you. Where? To the blazing torment of fire. So the shaitan has guidance. So the choice is between the guidance we receive from our Lord, from Allah, and the guidance and direction we receive from Satan. These are the choices. There is no third choice. أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ Very distinguishing type of huda. And وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Those are the successful ones. So the first type of people, nas, in the Qur'an are the believers. And that is the summary of their description. If you read the entire Qur'an about what should a believer think, what should a believer do, it is summarized for you in the first five ayat of the Qur'an, of Surah Al-Baqarah. Very, very powerful summary of everything. Anything else you see in the rest of the Qur'an can be referred to one of the points made here. Then the Qur'an moves directly into the second category of people, which is the kafirun. Because between iman and kufr, there is no third option. هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرٌ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنٌ It is he who has created you. Some of you are disbelievers and some of you are believers. Why is the Quran mentioning in this ayah that I am citing, why is the Quran mentioning مِنْكُمْ كَافِرٌ first? Why doesn't it say فَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنٌ وَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرٌ Because the kafirin are more numerous in number. وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ The vast majority of people will never turn to be believers. That's a fact. That's a fact. And we Muslims need to settle this issue within our heart as part of our faith. The vast majority of people will continue to reject you, reject your faith, reject your book, reject your prophet, and mock all of the above. That's a fact. Some of us believing and living a dream that one day humanity will turn right and they will take the right turn and the, uh, the guidance of Allah will establish the kingdom of God on earth and everybody will be nice. There is no such a thing. If it were this, this earth would have turned into paradise long time ago. So... فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ This is the majority. وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ Those are the few who will believe. I'm talking about the general human population. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes to us the attitude of the believers. Those who disbelieved. It is equal for them whether you warn them or you don't warn them. So what is the definition of the disbeliever here? The definition of the disbeliever is different from the definition of the unbeliever. The unbeliever is someone who has not received the message in full, complete, with all its evidence. This is unbeliever, someone who doesn't believe because he did not get exposed to the full message, the full knowledge, and the full evidence. But the disbeliever is someone who received all the evidence, all the information, and he decided not to believe it. Despite it might have touched his heart, but his interest is somewhere else. And the fight between our heart and our conscience, and our interest is constant, whether we are Muslims or non-Muslims. There is always a fight between the conscience Allah has set in your heart and the interest that you want to go after. 
So there is always a struggle. Man is created in kabad. The kabad is the struggle, the internal and external struggles. You struggle against your desires so that you adjust yourself. And when you succeed, you will be more inclined towards good than bad. And if you fail, it will be the opposite. If you surrender to your wicked inclinations, you become more like a devil than an angel. And if you succeed to balance it off with good things, you become more like a human, closer to an angel than being a devil. But inside us are qualities that are as evil as devilish qualities. And inside us are qualities that are as pure as angelic qualities. We choose when to display each of those. So when you want something from someone, the angel comes out. When somebody wants something from you and you don't want to deliver, the devil comes out. Right? We know how to display and deploy those weapons, if you will, at certain situations. You know, when you're treating your mom or dad with respect, that is the angel inside you. Right? And when you treat them badly, that is the devil inside you. That is what is selfish and evil and wicked. So when we make a choice and do not observe our own behavior, we will never correct it. So the purpose of this series is to bring to light and to highlight the issues that we need to be thinking about. So this is not a theoretical exercise about certain words in the Quran. This is about us because the Quran as a whole is about us as humans, individuals, societies, communities, and nations. Those who disbelieved, it's equal for them whether you warn them or you don't warn them. Does this mean that we should never warn anybody? Should we stop talking because it's equal? The Quran says it's equal, right? No, the Quran is saying it's equal after you have delivered the message complete and clear with evidence and then somebody says, I understand fully what you say and he could reiterate what you said to him and he says, but I don't want to believe in this. I don't like this way of life. That is rejecting the message. That is denying the message. This is a person that you don't want to waste your time trying to do anything regarding trying to teach him what he doesn't know. Does it mean that you should never talk to him? No, you should. But the Quran is saying the vast majority will not change much. That's where it says it's equal for them, whether you warn them or not, because they have made up their mind on basis of clear knowledge, clear vision, clear evidence. But before that, we are all guilty of not communicating the message to people around us. And we need to take that responsibility. So it says, for them it is equal whether you warn them or you don't warn them, they would not believe because they have made up their mind already. They have heard the full message. What happened to them? Allah has put a seal on their hearts and on their hearings and on their eyes and sight there is a cover. So if somebody doesn't hear, doesn't see, and his heart doesn't think, how do you penetrate to him? How do you get anything to him? You couldn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this description because his heart has been sealed by the seal of denial that he set on his own heart. So let us not read this in the opposite because some would read it and say, if Allah has sealed somebody's eyes and hearings and, uh, and heart, so what problem did he commit? He is unable to see truth because Allah has sealed his heart. But no, it is because of what they have earned. Because, as we explained before, much of the people who reject the truth, it is because of false perceived interest. One of the examples that we highlighted before is the example of Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul was later named the head of hypocrisy in Medina. He was in charge of the hypocrites. He was the leader of hypocrisy. This guy 
was being crowned as a king of Medina before the message of the Prophet ﷺ was coming to Medina. So when the message came and people saw the leadership in the coming Prophet ﷺ, envy started to boil in his heart. All the devilish grudges against this man coming to take leadership of where he grew up, where he is in control. People were about to crown him. There is a lot at stake for him. So he decided to never believe in Muhammad وسلم, to never accept his message. Despite the fact that he knew it was the truth. But he was not courageous enough to announce his disbelief and denial of the message. So he took a cover and the cover was in being hypocrite to pretend that he is a believer so that he doesn't lose Muslims and to, to hide the fact that he is a disbeliever to keep his connection with the disbelieving parties in Medina. This is the position that we will be talking about inshallah in the next week. But for now, we'll stop at two categories of people that the Quran classified and showed for us with their description, the believers and the disbelievers. I hope that the definitions are clear, inshallah. Zakumullah khair. Alhamdulillah wa kafa. والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة اللهم تقبله وارحمنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Brothers and sisters We, every one of us tries to understand the maximum he or she could about their careers. If I am an engineer or any professional or even a driver, I just want to learn the best and the most effective way to do my job. Have you ever thought to improve the quality of your performance as a believer? Have you ever thought to increase your knowledge? Have you ever thought about what you're missing if you don't seek more knowledge. We all claim, or mostly all of us, claim that we have no time for the Quran. We have no time for hadith. We have no time for classes or lectures or anything. And if I need something, I will go ask someone. Imagine, the first word in the Quran is what? Read. Read is the gateway to knowledge. Read is the gateway to information. It is the gateway to upgrade our knowledge so that we do better at what we have to do. In this life, you don't have to be an engineer, a doctor, a professional on anything. Those are means to an end. And Allah will provide for you whatever work you pick for yourself. I'm not saying don't try to be. I'm saying try to do your best. But not only to make money, but to make sure that your destiny is secure. What matters is not what you eat or drink through a journey. What matters more is what do you do when you arrive? And where are you going? That's what matters most. So please, read and keep reading, and never stop reading, and never read without thinking about what you read, and never read without applying what you learn from what you read. Otherwise, our life will be a life of people whose head is full of information, but their life is void of the influence and the impact of their faith. May Allah make us live as Muslims and die as Muslims. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك 
ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا كربا إلا نفسته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا مظلوما إلا نصرته اللهم انصر عبادك المظلومين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المظلومين في كل مكان اللهم ثبت أقدامهم ووحد صفهم وسدد رميتهم واجمع كلمتهم وأيدهم بنصرك المبين يا رب العالمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات من كل ذنب وأقم الصلاة